Hello, everyone. <laughs> Can you hear me okay on my fancy radio mic? Uh, I'm not sure why I've been okay, chosen go. to be yeah, the official Brittany of the event, but uh, I, I take this responsibility very seriously. Um, so uh, welcome to this event. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I am Sasha de Boyle, Director of Court International Festival of Literature, and I am here today to talk to two incredible writers, Mary Watson and Caroline O'Donoghue. Caroline O'Donoghue is a novelist, podcaster, and originally from Cork, the most important piece of, of information. Course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like this is the one place where we can really just oh like yeah. sit into the, the Cork <laughs> chat. We really bake into the Cork yeah, superiority yeah. complex, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, she's published two adult novels, uh, Promising Young Women and Scenes of a Graphic Nature, uh, and also is an award-winning journalist and podcaster with many podcasts, but Sentimental Garbage is one that you should really check out. And then last year, there was a brilliant one about sex in the city. Mm -hmm of the name I cannot remember. Sentimental in the City it was called. That's what it was. I knew it was like a mashup. Um, but let me let me say more nice things about you. Okay. <laughs> um, your first YA novel, All Our Hidden Gifts, uh, came out in 2020. And the follow-up came out just last year. That feels about right, yes. What is time? What now? is time? Who yeah. knows? I've published knows? four novels, three of which came out during the pandemic, so I have no idea how it's, it's supposed to go. You're incredibly productive. <laughs> yeah. um, and joining us as well is Mary Watson, who grew up in Cape Town during apartheid uh, and did her master's in creative writing with Andre Brink. Uh, she appeared on Hay Festival's Africa 39 list of influential writers and is now a Galwegian, which is, I would say, the other county that is the most proud of where it's from. Very, very <laughs> shocking to me as a Cork person who lives in Galway to go there and be like, what do you mean you think this is the best county? <laughs> um, and Blood to Poison is her third novel for young adults and her first based in South Africa. So welcome, Caroline and Mary. Thank you for joining us. Can you give us a big round of applause? Yeah. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm kind of really liking the uh, informal vibe of this whole thing. The press conference table is very formal, but yes. the rest no, of it is extremely It's been extremely a wonderful chill. festival so far. And I think unlike, I've done quite a few festivals, most of them in the UK, but this is, Bantry is so notable, I think, for the line between um, sort of people who are speaking and people who are here to attend. It feels very blurred. It feels like everyone's socializing together, everyone's packed in together, and there isn't this kind of strange us and them hierarchy kind of thing. But, uh, you know, the Brits love a class system, so they, <laughs> they, they love a talent over here, punters over here system. <laughs> um, in Edinburgh, they have like a, like a, a triple layer system. The press have a separate tent yeah. and they're not allowed to go near the author tent so that the authors can have like privacy without the press oh, there. Yeah. And they're very, very serious about it. It's a great festival, but I always thought oh, that was yeah. very funny. Oh, Cheltenham, they have three green rooms that are tiered through importance of guests. Oh, really? Yeah, I know, wow. I know. Wow. But, well, I was in I was in the third one, but I did catch Ed Miliband in my tent, <laughs> having a panic attack. <laughs> uh, he was like, I have to go to the lower tier green room to have a panic attack so that the top yeah. tier people don't see me freaking That's out. That's what labour is all about, from what I can see. <laughs> well, um, and Mary, very importantly, how are you finding Gork? Oh, I like it, yeah. <laughs> this is my second time in Bantry and it's, it's um, it's it's beautiful. There's also there's a Bantry Bay in Cape Town, so it makes me feel kind of close to it. It's weird, yeah. There's a place kind of on the on the ocean in like one of the really nice parts of Cape Town, and it's called Bantry Bay, which obviously must have been named after here. So it makes me feel quite at home. Oh, well, that is very very nice to hear. You're very welcome to Cork. Mm -hmm. You can stay as long as you like. <laughs> um, so, uh, firstly, I wanted to say I adored uh, all of these books. So uh, thank you so much for writing them. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about how you both came to writing YA um, and how that ended up being a genre for you because I know you have written across multiple genres um, and you did a master's in creative writing and then kind of took your time and then eventually came back to writing so yeah. Do you know what, it's a combination of like um, luck, timing and business choices <laughs> um, because you know, when I first got into, when I first met my agent back in 2015, I had built kind of a profile online um, through journalism and that kind of thing and she approached me about writing a novel and at that point the longest thing I had written that was a piece of fiction was a piece of um, historical fiction for teenagers based on the court of Henry VIII, but everyone's magic, you know, <laughs> which now feels very commercial. But uh, then she kind of said, like, listen to me, you know, you're not going to make a penny in YA. 
And it was actually, I find it fascinating because um, this would have been 2015 and so is it, I find publishing trends fascinating because there had been this huge boom of um, you know Hunger Games, Twilight, there had been this enormous YA boom. And what had followed that YA boom was that uh, lots of publishers had thrown sort of bad money after good, picking up these really inflated series, like the sort of thing, like obviously Divergent was huge, but there was lots of things that were trying to mimic that, like it's the end of the world and one girl will fight against this arbitrarily corrupt system. And um, a lot of them had failed. And so a lot of English publishers had gone very conservative and they were like, let's just import all the stuff from America. Let's not take any chances on homegrown talent. And so my agent said to me, you know, don't listen, just grow your talent or whatever, grow your craft in adult fiction, because those are the audience you have anyway online, which is very canny advice. And I went away and I wrote two novels. And um, then I came back to her in 2019. And um, I was actually telling the story to my writing group yesterday, which is that um, I was my first book was on the shelves. My second book was, I had just finished it. So I was basically making zero, zero pounds <laughs> off, off of being a novelist. Um, and I was, had a very kind of threadbare financial existence happening um, because, you know, I was, I was a very ass journalist. Um, but then within a month, maybe I think six weeks of each other, the two publications that I worked for folded overnight kind of thing. And so I was just like, oh God, I'm, I'm totally broke. And at the same time, um, like literally days of after that, uh, my eldest sister became very, very ill. And so I had to go home to Cork for a while. And before I went home to Cork, I went up with my agent and I just, it was a very Bob Cratchit situation asking for more coal for the fire of um, being like, look, if there's anything you thought I should do over the years, tell me now and I will do it. And she said, YA. And I said, well, didn't you say that there was no money in YA? <laughs> and I'm coming here specifically about money. <laughs> um, and she said something very interesting. She said, you know, there has been a huge um, boom in the last sort of five or six years among uh, eight to 11 year olds reading mysteries. And she said, if you can write a mystery, all basically all those five to eight to 11 year olds, now they're growing up, now they're teenagers. They want a homegrown mystery about kids they can recognize, kids they can see. And she was like, write me a mystery. And I said, well, I, I've never, don't, I don't know how. Um, and simultaneously, I was very into my tarot cards and it just seemed like, you know, dollar signs in my eyes or whatever. <gasps> like, <laughs> kids love tarot cards. I love tarot cards. Kids love mysteries. A mystery about tarot cards. And then it all kind of followed after that. I see, okay. Mary, how about you? Um, I started writing YA by accident. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really an intended planned thing at all. So I'd written several sort of adult books um, too, actually. Um, when you say it like that, it sounds like you mean adult, adult as in the... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, wasn't adult books in that way. Um, but books for adults in, um, in South Africa. and. Um, then we moved here and my mother was diagnosed with cancer and I had babies and it was just kind of like a lot of life was happening so I kind of stepped back from writing, stepped back from doing, um, I'd worked as a, at, at universities, I kind of just stepped back from all of that and focused on my personal life at that point. And um, after, when I was really kind of ready to start writing again, I decided I wanted to write a fantasy book so I kind of sat down and came up with this magic system and started writing this fantasy book and I was loving it and I was really enjoying it. And then when I got to the end of the draft of the book, um, I kind of looked at it and thought, well, this is YA. So while I'd been writing the book, I'd been reading lots of the Cassandra Clares and um, Divergent and all of those books um, because it was around this time period when they were all really popular and realized that while I was writing this book, I'd been ingesting all this YA and I'd inadvertently written a YA myself without, mm -hmm. without setting out to do it. So that is the story of how I came to write YA. And were, were you like confounded? Were you, did you have a response that were like, oh great, or were you like, oh no, <laughs> this is not what I intended? Um, well, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm still not sure. I mean, yeah, I'm, I like, there's a lot that I like about YA. When I was working in Cape Town, I worked at the universities, I really liked working with that kind of age group, um, I suppose, even though university would be slightly older. So there was something very exciting about kind of connecting with, with younger people again. So I enjoyed that part of it. Um, but I am also very sweary. So like, you know, when you're writing <laughs> YA, you kind of do need to count how many swear words you're putting into yeah. it. 
because too much is too much, you know, so. It's, does an Irish way novel just warrant full-on swearing? Like it's just okay because it's used so casually? <laughs> or is that not cool? <laughs> what's, what's actually fabulous is that um, when you're dealing with the US publishers, if you're, um, you know, it's weird because All Hidden Gifts in the US is technically like an ethnic book because it's an Irish book, <laughs> you know. Um, but I've got like, I've got like gowl bag in there the whole time yeah, yeah. and they have no idea what it means. <laughs> You're like, that's actually quite, quite yeah. gross. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did think that actually, yeah, I remember, I, I, I noticed that while I was reading it, just lots of lovely, yeah. especially some, some lovely Cork slang thrown in. And do you know what, I actually, I kind of fought for that Cork, cork slang really because I just thought, you know, um, I spent my entire life watching American TV shows mm -hmm. and not knowing what like yams were. Remember, they'd always be talking about, oh, you got the yams ready for Thanksgiving? And I was like, what's a yam? <laughs> and I was like, you know, we're this country where we're always looking at everybody else, but people are seldom looking back. And I was kind of like, no, if you're gonna, if you're gonna buy an Irish book, you're gonna buy my ethnic book, <laughs> you, can, um, you can really buy it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think both books, to be honest, uh, do that so well. You know, they use setting in place and, and, and there's such a specificity to it that I think with probably actually those YA books that failed, mm. uh, there's kind of like a, a, a generic, genericism, genericness uh, to them in an attempt to be universal because they're just aping things that have gone before that are rooted in, say, American or British literary traditions, though they might not even realise it. So to have that specificity there, I think, just makes them stand out. Um, what was it like for you to, to bring kind of South Africa and Cape Town into your writing? Yeah, well, big question that. But I just wanted to just add to what you were saying. That is my permanent rant, the way that we're expected <laughs> to always kind of catch up to mm -hmm. kind of UK and US norms and language and, and know without question. And then I do feel that I've had some kind of pushback. Well, I don't understand what this is. Um, well, I don't know what a sophomore is. Well, I didn't know what a sophomore, but I've had to figure these things out because we're always kind of reading to center. And um, now I'm feeling like I kind of need to write to center or be, be required to write to center as well. And I can make that adjustment. And I think it's only fair that other people that readers make that adjustment too. Mm. Anyway, sorry, the question was about writing about South Africa. Mm -hmm. So this is a very different, this was like one of the big things about writing this book. This was going to be my fun book. So when I started writing them, this book is like, this book is going to be fun. It's about this girl who discovers magic and there's these markets and actually behind the scenes, they've got all these magical things and there's a boy and she falls in love with the boy and it's all just fun. <laughs> but then I started thinking, well, okay, What's the story? Oh, she's cursed. Okay, cursed, that, that's still fun. And then I thought, well, <laughs> what is she cursed about? Well, she's cursed to be angry. Hmm, less fun? Well, she's not quite cursed to be angry. She's cursed to die young, but she, and makes her really angry. Less fun. Okay, so where does this curse come from? Well, there's this enslaved ancestor. Oh my God, Mary, that is just so not fun. So like we, we kind of veered way off the fun path when I started kind of introducing anger and enslaved ancestors and also South Africa and the history of apartheid and all of that because it's it's implicit it's very difficult to write a book set in South Africa without kind of being aware of the of how the society works of the how the of the context of the place um so even though we kind of I, I knew that it was important for me to include all these things but at the same time to keep the book as a book that is essentially a fun book that mm. that's a, that's a magical adventure a journey of discovery that brings pleasure to readers and not make them kind of uh, too much, too much. So I wanted to keep that balance and I think that was one of the, the huge, huge um, challenges that I had writing this book was to maintain that balance and to not just kind of use the trauma of South Africa as kind of fuel for a fun story, but to, to address it responsibly, but then also to not make it take over. Yeah, yeah, and actually that's something that both books do so well because, you know, uh, All Our Hidden Gifts just draws from, you know, Ireland's fairly grim histories as well and mm. the religious right, uh, but it doesn't, it still has moments of real levity and a lot of fun in it too. Oh, thank um, you. Yeah, yeah. Was that, was that important to you to keep that balance um, and, to, and to actually maybe draw light to, to, yeah, like less pleasant aspects of Irish history for a global audience? Very similar to you, Mary. I was like, oh, this will be my fun time. This is my fun baby. And then, um, yeah, so I sort of, and you were like, cool, hate crimes. Just yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, this this thing of like, I, I, I the, 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 the kind of central sort of mystery was a, was a classic missing girl narrative, right? Which we've seen a million times. 
And um, the idea that she gets this tarot card that comes up that has never been seen before and then she disappears suddenly and that this is the sort of um, the essence of this card, the demon that lives in this card taking her away. And then uh, when I got with that, I was like, well, that's a short story, really, you know, like I, um, there's nothing, it doesn't feel very active fighting a demon that is just sort of faceless and sort of works like a robot kind of thing. And so what I kind of stumbled on when I was writing it was that, okay, what if there's this whole existing sort of magical atmosphere within this world and what if the summoning of this demon that really starts with just a, a fight between two teenage girls summoning the, the, the power of their fury and their hatred for one another is so huge that they accidentally sort of summon this thing it therefore kind of rips a kind of a hole in in the sort of magical atmosphere that that lives in this little Irish town and it's this kind of thing of like when you catch a big fish you leave a big hole in the net and this idea that there's, in the book, there's this kind of religious right movement that are kind of coming from the US and is slowly infiltrating in and they use many things in order to gain control, sort of like propaganda, money, resources, but one of the things they use is also sort of magic and manipulation. And they kind of fill in this hole here and they kind of come in. And what was this, this fun thing of like juggling this huge supernatural sort of, oh, a demon has taken a girl away plot with this very, what I feel to be a grounded and real threat of, um, and, and I think what, what interested me the most in that really was that, you know, I was born in, in 1990, so I feel like millennials are probably the last generation to kind of remember Catholic Ireland in its, you know, we, we kind of had the dying embers, I feel. Like, um, like we still, you know, we still had the nuns teaching us and, you know, and uh, having a real sense of, of um, sort of shame, really, I think. And we grew up with the fear of having to, if we got pregnant, having to go to England and all that stuff. And with Gen Z, they're kind of growing up in an Ireland that is different to ours and is freer and is more liberated and is more accepting of queer ideology and, and all, all of that, all the brilliant stuff that Gen Z are so good at. But my fear is that they're so good at that, like, maybe, what if they couldn't recognize mm. hatred if it came walking in, you know, yeah. wearing converse, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that to me felt scarier than a demon. Mm. Um, and that's how they kind of made their way into the book, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's brilliant. Actually, it's so funny you're talking about the remnants of Catholic Ireland and growing up Catholic because before the event I was talking to your mum and we went to the same school. No yeah. way! <laughs> yeah. In Carberry. Yeah, yeah, in the boarding what? school with Sister Regina. Oh, wow. Same same nun. <laughs> so. That's mad. Yeah, isn't it? Small world. Um, but something specifically about writing setting and place for both of you is that you're both writing about a setting that you don't actively live in. Yeah. But you've managed to conjure up a very vivid portrait of that place and I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of touch on that and see what that was like? Did you have to do lots of research trips back to court? Is my question. <laughs> <laughs> do you want to go first? Um, yeah, so the, I, mean, I know South Africa, I know Cape Town very well. I've lived there most of my life, even though I've lived here for the last sort of 13 years. But um, it, it was difficult, and I'd meant to go over um, in 2019, but I didn't make it over just for logistical reasons. And I thought, okay, I'll go over at the beginning of 2020. No problem. It's planning my trip to go over for March 2020. And it's like, well, actually, there's this thing that's happening in China, which makes me make, maybe I should just watch and see what happens before I book. So obviously, I didn't make it over while I was um, still, you know, doing the substantial work on the book. So it was difficult and it was a difficult time in that my father got really sick at that point and I was um, unable to go home but at the same time I was kind of editing this book and there was almost a kind of solace in it you know that I'd made this fictional Cape Town based on my memory of the place and returning to that in my fiction when I couldn't go there in person when I desperately needed to go there in person um, was very comforting in, its, in, its, in a strange kind of way. Um, but I think mostly, like Cape Town, like when I drive around Galway, I don't know the back roads. I don't know the secret passages. I don't know the, the bits and pieces you know from when you grow up in a place. But I know Cape Town like that. I know Cape Town inside out, back to front, upside down in all possible ways. I know all the back routes. I know the fastest of two different routes. I know everything about it. And there's nothing about living away from it for any number of time that will take that out of my DNA because mm -hmm. it is in my blood. Yeah. yeah. And for 
it's so funny. We've had such similar experiences of writing, and that I think, um, well, yeah, as I said earlier on, like I was, um, I'd lost those two jobs, and then I, um, I came home to Cork for I think two and a half weeks, which was the, you know, because there was all this family stuff going on, and um, it was the longest I'd ever spent at home since I'd emigrated, kind of thing. And um, I'd emigrated in 2011 when I was 21, and which I think. And that, that, that decision to emigrate was very much based on the fact that Cork was a very depressing place to be at that time. Like it really was, like everywhere was closed down and like I'd had this really fun teenage time and it's like a great place to be a teenager or certainly was in the years where we were teenagers kind of thing of like you can kind of get the bus anywhere and you can kind of walk anywhere and like every, you kind of feel like you know everyone, everyone feels kind of safe, you go out quite young, you know. But then I hit this thing where I am... Um, I went to university in Cork, and so oh, by the time I was 20, I felt about 40. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> because when you're going out since you're about 15 or 16, because you're using, you know, your brother's girlfriend's student ID or something, yeah. then by the time you're 20, you're like, I've been around this city 3,000 times. Jaded, yeah. And you've got all these people coming down to the university, and they're coming from like Clare or Louth or wherever, and like they're really excited to be in Cork, and you just feel like this old dame propping up the bar, like, you don't know what it used to be like, you know, <laughs> like. <laughs> and so by the time I left when I was 21, I was, I, I was just so excited to be back Cork. Like I was so done. And then, and I, I immigrated, I, was, I, I didn't know anyone when I immigrated. Um, and I was kind of on my own for the first sort of few years. And my circle of friends was all English or people who had moved to London from other places. I had no real Irish friends until people started immigrating over in their kind of late 20s, which is when people tend to kind of mostly do it. And I think memories are kept alive primarily by chat. Yeah. And I had no one to sort of go over those memories with. I know exactly what you mean. You know, the thing of like, oh, do you remember when we go down to Red Zeppelins? Or we go down to the Rogue? Or we do this? Or we go down to the Peace Park? Or all that. Um, there was no one to talk about that stuff with. So it had kind of, I'd kind of forgotten about it. Yeah. And then with this two and a half weeks that I spent in Cork, it was such a weird thing because all my siblings were home and it was such an emotional time. And, but I was back in the small bedroom that I had grown up in because I'm the youngest. And it was this thing of this desk where I used to do my homework on. Now my knees couldn't fit underneath it kind of thing. And, you know, there's something about a family emergency that puts everybody back in their role, you know. And I was just the baby again. I was this baby at the, at the sort of end of all these kind of charismatic people. And I always just felt very kind of like squirrely and sort of my mum politely says, you were dreamy, <laughs> which, which is a bit. Which is a bit like, you know, when you see a really uncharismatic baby and you say, oh, he's taking it all in. <laughs> um, and um, I was taking it all in. Um, and uh, so walking around Cork, because, uh, you know, just that was all there was to do was walk around. And I was like, this was actually a fabulous place to grow up. Mm -hmm. And it all came back and like playing gigs and being in bands with my friends and kind of hanging out with older people and... Mm -hmm. All that kind of thing it all came back and it was it felt like a great place of safety and comfort in in the time that was so uncertain in so many different ways mm -hmm. and i think that's why it was so much fun to write it was just yeah it was a real solace it was like a like a comfort blanket you know yeah, absolutely um all of your descriptions of cork growing up are just really evocative like that's exactly what it was like for me and when i moved away again yeah i didn't hang out with anyone from cork or from ireland and so to come back to it, yeah, and to see it change was always very strange. Yeah. Um, and my, my little sister lives in Cork and she's obsessed with Cork. She talks about it all the time. She's <laughs> desperate for me to move to Cork. Um, and every time I come in, she's like, are you going to actually hang out in Cork? You know, mm. like Cork, Cork. <laughs> I'll do my best. Um, we can't talk about these books without talking about anger, which is really great. Mm. Um, something that I found so refreshing about both of them as someone who loves young adult books and has read a lot, especially as a teenager, like I was mad for it. And you know, a lot of the heroines were always very like, just like, you know, they were perfect in every way. They were noble and brilliant and kind and beautiful and everyone was in love with them and they had a terrible choice to make. Um, and what I really like about these two books is that the protagonists are raging all the time <laughs> and they're kind of jerks they don't yeah. really handle their emotions well they lash out but they feel really real and i just like that that's so brill and i just wanted to ask you guys yeah just a little bit about what it was like to bring that anger into the books 
Especially you, Mary, because you're so nice. And the book is so angry. She's the nicest woman in show business. I was reading it and I was like, Mary, whoa. I'm not actually that nice. <laughs> um, I don't know, like, I mean, I suppose there is a thing, like, you, you say that I'm so nice, but actually, like, I'd say if you spoke to my sisters. Um, there, there is a, that veneer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Like, we present, we're always nice, and now heroines are nice, and our well, manners are good, because this is what we're required to do. Mm -hmm. um, you put out good, solid role models in your YA books so that girls can mm -hmm. get some good, aspire to have their good manners or whatever. No, and I think that there is, <coughs> there is an increasing awareness of how complicated people are and how complicated girls are and how we should be allowed to be that gloriously complicated in all in all its manifestations and when I was writing that book myself when I was myself feeling kind of pissed off all the time it's like this low-grade simmering rage and it had a lot to do with um, it was 2019 Trump was still around um, you know, we were, every time it turned on the TV, somebody was lying, some politician was telling another lie, somebody was getting away with doing something wrong, and it just, and like now it's almost become normal, isn't it? Like they just, they do it all the time, it's just, oh God, they're doing it again. Whereas then there was still kind of a kind of newness about it, how this is not acceptable. Anyways, so I had this kind of constant low-grade rage, and I think that this was a sane response to an insane world. I think that the world isn't healthy at the moment, and I think that it is quite normal to feel angry about the world not being healthy. There's a climate um, crisis and nothing's, you know, it's not urgently being addressed. Um, the whole way that information works has become really problematic. So there's so much to be angry about. And I, and I wanted to write something where um, people who feel that kind of anger um, inside them could f kind of feel that recognition because it's always good when you see yourself in a book. Um, but then also there's the historical kind of element, the kind of background of South Africa, and that's all kind of in there as well. And um, I just wanted to explore the range of a anger and to see, to see how it could be useful, how mm. it could be dangerous. So there's, there's, it's, I'm not just kind of putting fo it forward as this kind of glorious, wonderful weapon, because I think that there is a lot of danger that if you, t if you given to anger too much it can kind of burn you from the inside it can destroy you so it just there's a lot to play around with and i think this book was really in a lot of ways an exploration of anger for me mm -hmm. and something that's really nice about both books actually uh before we uh carry on is just that the the characters that, that support them their families their friends actually don't give up on on Savannah and Maeve mm. when they you know don't have their angry and productive ways or when when they're jerks or I'm trying to think of uh, appropriate words yeah. <laughs> instead of saying arseholes. Yeah, she's an arsehole, yeah. 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 Um, but they don't give up on them and I think there's something about, like I just think about, the, like what if you were a teenage girl reading that, I say this as an ancient woman, <laughs> um, and realising that it's okay to be angry and that, you know, even if you might make mistakes, people aren't going to give up on you. It's just like, yeah. it's a very lovely message. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, definitely, I don't want to echo everything Mary just said because I feel so the same in that like I do feel that um, and I think most of the people in this room will remember what it is like to grow up as a teenage girl and how so much of how your your life is about outward appearances and appearing mm. to be sort of nice and pleasant and sort of going with the flow and stuff and I think we there is a huge reckoning of like you know women I think particularly the few last few years has really cracked open the female psyche as well like yeah. between between Me Too, but also Repeal as well. Like we we know what our rage is capable of when it when when it appears in great numbers, you know. And that I think is very moving. And I think it's, you know, I see a lot of I, I meet a lot of mothers of teenage daughters at book signings and that kind of stuff. And they're so passionate that their daughters aren't going to be these go with the flow girls, you know. And I find that really moving, really moving. But on the other hand, just Maeve's an arsehole. Like she's, <laughs> um, like she she frequently says and does the wrong thing. And she's also she's an arsehole the way same the, for the same reason the rest of us are is that she's really just self absorbed and yes. she's she's like, yeah. There's like in the second book there's a scene wherein 
she um so she, by the second book she is a telepath <laughs> and instead of like using that power for good she instead uses it to like sort of cheat on an exam because she's so she's so terrified of like that she's going to be separated from her pals um in her like in her leaving cert class because they're they're kind of sorting them into honors and pass and she knows she's going to be in pass so she <laughs> this is how she's using her divinely ordained power she's cheating in an exam but the person she's cheating off is her best friend Fiona, who is is biracial and who is a scholarship kid and who's you know brilliant in school or whatever. And Maeve's just thinking like, oh, I just don't want to lose Fiona. And then she's so absorbed with all of this that when they when they get caught, which obviously they do, and Fiona's raging, she's like, do you not understand that like I'm a scholarship kid and that you're not, and that if we get caught out in a, in a crime, that like I at the end of the day like you make the money and I cost the money and that you are putting my entire future in and these are the things that we don't think about because when we're self-absorbed and but like I wanted to have a character like that who frequently makes those kinds of mistakes because I do think that like YA is I think it's the most exciting genre to be a part of right now it's the most fast moving most fast responding genre to be in like you the, that section of the bookshop is just like it's a it's a rainbow now. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It's, like yeah, it's an explosion of color. Like even just you guys' beautiful, yeah, beautiful yeah. books, which are available for sale after the event, <laughs> yeah. um, are gorgeous. Like you just didn't have covers like this growing exactly. up. They were all like muted greys and of very course. dark. It's it's, and, it's such an amazing genre to be part of because I feel like it's constantly striving. It's listening to the teenagers, right? Yeah. Which is like we want more queer stories. We want more diverse stories. We want all these kind of stories. And the the industry is responding because it's making the money. Like and you so you see a lot of YAs that have um, a queer romance at the center of it, or or a trans person center of it, or like or or whatever, um, and they're they're fantastic. And the heart, the Heartstopper books are like tearing up the charts. Yeah, yeah. Like I went to a YA conference the other day, and it was like when Alice Osman was in there who wrote Heartstopper. It was like Elvis had entered the building. Like it was yeah. mad, and it was divine to see. Um, but I hadn't seen any books that were about allyship, you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah. for as many queer teens that are going to pick up books, there are also going to be straight teens who are going to pick up books that are like, uh, have an evolving friend group that they mm -hmm. are going to often make mistakes with. And I wanted to provide a friend group where not everybody was perfect, but everybody loved each other so deeply and, and were trying their hardest you know, to, to be sensitive to one another. And I felt like that was an important thing, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually that leads really nicely onto, I wanted to touch on the character of Ro because uh, they're such a such a gorgeous character. Yeah, um, And yeah, what it was like to incorporate that character uh, into the book, where they came from for you. Yeah, it came from a very simple place really, Com probably simplistic place, which is that I had been reading a lot of YA um, over the years and I noticed that the there's like two male love interests that you can have in YA, is it, which is he has brown hair, which means which means he's the boy next door and you grew up with him your whole life, and then one day you look around, you turned around, and he's like six foot seven, and like he's and, turned and, into Liam Hemsworth. Yeah, he's turned into Liam Hemsworth. Like, oh my God, who could have seen it coming? And then there's black hair. And and black hair is bad news. And he's he's got a leather jacket and a flick knife, and he's coming around. And um, and I was seeing a lot of you know uh, cool girls who could be one of the boys. Yeah, you know, yeah. and like, oh, I'll go around and hand you a spanner while you're working on your car, <laughs> and one day you'll you'll look up and you'll realize you're in love with me. And so it started from this place of like, I'm sick of I'm fucking sick of these girls who are one of the boys. I want a boy who can be one of the girls kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And someone who like want loves to hang out yeah. in that very sort of femme atmosphere. And then I just sort of started kept tipping away at it, kept tipping away at it. And um, then I, I was I kind of I brought up this memory from the vaults that I was at a music festival a few years ago. Mm. And do you know, this is kind of rambling, but do you know what music festivals were like? You, you go through, you traipse through the mud and you have your crap tent and you, you're like having your warm beer and you're like, why am I doing this? And then you have one of those magical evenings and you're like, oh, this is why. I was at a fire and I was next to this um, musician and we were like really buzzing off each other. We were like, wow. And like, my boyfriend was like, have fun. And <laughs> I'll have you have your crush over there. And then while we were kind of walking through the sort of fairy light sort of little bit in the festival, um, they told me that they were trans and I was like, oh, I, I didn't know, I didn't realize. And, and they were like, yeah, it's kind of on the DL right now, but this is, this is the deal. 
And um, that <coughs> sort of buzzing fairy light feeling kind of went into the creation of Ro. I was like, yeah. that's who I'm drawing on for this yeah, character. Yeah. Because that's like uh, that person sort of just made me feel so excited and alive that evening. Um, I've never spoken to them since. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wanted that sort of phosphorescence and that magic. And I, and I, and I do feel that uh, when you're writing about magic, it's, you know, so much of magic is transformation. Yeah. It's the turning of one thing into something else. You know, I read this description in Jessica Dore's book, um, Tarot for Change. Like magic is the belief that the subtle rules the dense. Mm. And I feel like that's something about that that kind of feels like trans ideology to me. This like the idea that it's not just about what you can see or what's between your legs. It's, it's like it's, yeah. it's the subtle ruling the dense, mm -hmm. you know, and I thought that was worth including. Definitely, you know? yeah. And, and something that's so lovely about that character is, um, you know, often trans or non-binary binary, storylines can be like, oh, this person is transitioning and there will only be negative, uh, you know, consequences because it's so hard. But actually, Ro is like, like a total sex symbol. I yeah. love how obsessed with them Maeve is. Like yeah. every time they come out in a new outfit, she's like, they are so hot. Look at what they're wearing. <laughs> yeah. It's so great. Um, and to, to see that kind of elevated and to be like, no, this yeah. isn't something strange or it is something strange, but it's something strange and wonderful and really hot. I enjoy yeah. it. I enjoy that. Yeah. And much. crucially hot. Like crucially, not, most importantly. Not noble, but hot. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and uh, similarly, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the love interest of Blood to Poison, Dex, who is a very kind of strange and mysterious fella. Is he a black hair or a brown hair <laughs> to you? <laughs> well, I suppose like when, you know, when you, you, when you grow up in the kind of community that I grew up in, like most people are kind of mm -hmm. dark haired in one way or another. So um, he kind of fits in, 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 and I'm kind of trying to think how to say this without giving too many spoilers away, mm -hmm. but like mm -hmm. there's very much um, a kind of ambivalence, a kind of, yeah, yeah straddling the line. And I think, um, I mean, I quite like morally grey characters, I quite like mm -hmm. dark characters, I quite like characters who embrace um, complicated approaches to the world. And I think that he would embody that for me. I kind of don't want to go in too much into it because yeah. I think that once once I talk too much about that, I'm kind of skipping a bit ahead. I know, I know. I was yeah. like, how do I ask this without <laughs> that spoiling? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I think we might open up for some audience questions if you guys are keen to ask them. I have plenty more, so don't feel any pressure. The question is, uh, yeah, uh, is there a kind of a crossover audience for your work? Are you finding a lot of adults reading your work, even though it's YA? Absolutely, definitely. I would say it's weighted to, I'd say 70, 30, 70% 70 grown, <laughs> grown people. But the thing, I, I would totally relate to you because I am a, a huge, do you know, I'm actually less of a, a huge YA reader now because I write it and it feels like a busman's holiday. Um, um, but in my 20s, I was going through them. Like I loved them and, and like, you know, going through a book a week. Um, but the strange thing, when I was an actual teenager, I was reading F. Scott Fitzgerald and Hemingway, <laughs> and I was so desperate to be, you know, literary or whatever that I, I tried to, you know, gulp down as many important books as possible. And it was actually in my twenties where like life gets rough a bit. Like you're you've got your first big bit of business going on, <laughs> your big jobs and stuff, and it's really hard. Life feels um like your twenties are difficult, man. Like it feels like um the herd is separating, you know, even though it's not that way, obviously, like people find themselves and find success at all different decades and times of their life. But you get that first panic in your 20s where like, oh, it feels like, you know, people are already being called to greatness and that you are being left behind and that you're on, you know, some like a very boring marketing job, which I had for most of my 20s, you know, it, it, life feels very gray, actually, which is why I totally got into the YA kind of, I would say, so sort of 24 to 29 would have been my peak years of like just gulping them down. So I think that has a lot to do with it, really. It is mostly, I would say the, my average reader would be about 25, you know? Yeah, I think it is, there's still quite a big crossover. And it's, it's, it's lovely when I, when I do see kind of real teens getting in touch with me and saying that they read it and enjoyed it. But I also very much enjoy and relate to kind of older um, readers who, who still read it. And I think also, in, to a large extent, I kind of write the books for both. I mean, I'm very aware that 
the target audience is teenagers and we don't want to push teenagers out of that space but at the same time I do know that there are older people reading it so I can probably get away with might be five six seven swear words I'm not quite <laughs> sure um, but the the other thing is that yeah I started reading YA because I had babies and I wanted to read books that didn't have any babies in them <laughs> like I just like, I couldn't like my life yeah. is full of babies I wanted nothing when I read it was escape it had and I found why it was great because like generally there are no babies yeah. <laughs> yeah unless that's the whole book do you know what I mean that they're having a baby <laughs> I wouldn't read those <laughs> no me neither magic only um, Anyone else for a question? I wanted to ask you guys about your uh, your influences. Like, who, which, which writers were you you, you kind of really uh, influenced by when starting to write in these genres, and kind of who who took you in and who guided you? And this is partly just a veiled attempt to ask a question about Margaret Mahi because I'm a huge fan of her oh work. My God. Um, yeah. So uh, we'll get back to that. Um, but yeah, uh, what what kind of influences um, do you think you draw on? I don't know. Um, it, it wouldn't necessarily be either other YA writers. I think when I started writing these books, I kind of moved because I'd previously written literary fiction, so which is a different kind of writing. It's a more kind of mood-based, theme-based, idea-based. It's, it's a different flow. But when I started writing these books, it was storytelling in a, in a really kind of mm. essential way. And I think that my the writers that I kind of admire our writers were good at storytellers who like you just kind of really get the sense that they know how to weave a story and that's the the, the main thing so like a, a book that I recent book well not that recent but that I felt was a really good story would be Circe by Martin and Miller I mm. really love that I think just the sense of storytelling there is really fantastic um, an older one um, would be Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell which is also just a magnificent huge story so like I think my the writers and the books that I look up to are the, the kind of the storytelling books, the stories. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's so interesting with this because like I, I found increasingly that all of my influences for all our hidden gifts are um, writers who were at their peak in the eighties kind of thing. And we I spoke a bit at the beginning about publishing trends. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, I don't know if you'll resent this, Mary, but I think we're very untrendy actually. <laughs> because there's... I have always been. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm talking in very broad, I would never say like, oh, we're the only ones doing this kind of thing. But when I'm looking at a table in Waterstones in, in YA or whatever, um, the dominant trends in this age category seem to be either um, a whole different world entirely where it's like they're you know in, in a world where the kingdom of Ashkavi has been da -da -da -da, and it's like, which are great and I love those um, or it's like um, there's a murder in the school and one of us did it you know that seems to be the, the, the dominant kind of trends whereas um, this kind of thing where like teenage girl who has to go to school every day and has to interact with her family and have to, has to do stuff and look after her brother and all kind of, all kind of stuff. Um, but also she's magic, but the magic is kind of every day and baked yeah. in. It's um, very 80s actually. Yeah, yeah, magical realism. is. Ma yeah, it's very magical realism. So it's Margaret Mayhe, it's Diana Wynne-Jones for would be the, the two big influences for me. And I think because those were, those writers are so interested in the feminine as being already magical, yeah. as being this thing of like, you know, the changeover is this story about um, this girl whose brother is possessed by a succubus kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And even the way he becomes possessed, oh, it's, so it's so creepy. It's like the changeover. No, no. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, it's so good. So what, <laughs> but what happens is that like her and her brother kind of wander into the antique shop kind of thing. And there's kind of a creepy antiques guy, but she's kind of being polite and she's like, yeah. okay. And then the brother, the, the antiques guy says to the little brother, um, oh, would you like a stamp for your hand? And the brother puts out the hand for stamp and the stamp goes down and then the brother starts to get really sick and he's sort of so being this drained. This is what happens when you're nice. She should have just been angry with him in the first yeah, place. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, fear, fear niceness. Yeah, exactly. Um, but then she has to go through this process where she changes over to becoming a witch and she kind of almost dies in the process. And, and then some character, she's like, I don't know if I'm ready to change. And, and someone kind of says, well, you're changing all the time anyway, mm -hmm. you know? And that thing of like, uh, you know, having a female body uh, at that age, it's, it, is, it does feel like a dark art, you know, <laughs> like 
Like, you've ever emptied a moon cup? That's some witchy <laughs> shit. Like, <laughs> you know? And um, I think those, those are the authors that, that speak to me so much because they found something very dark and mysterious just in owning this body. You yeah, know? and in the everyday. And it's funny because when I first read The Changeover and Margaret Mayhew's work in general, I thought of her work as, you know, like I was saying earlier, just very universal. You know, I was like, I, these characters speak to me, these experiences speak to me, I love them. And a couple of years ago, I went to Christchurch, where she was from. Yeah. And uh, the book is set in Christchurch, and I reread it while I was there, and I was like, oh, yeah. oh, this is Christchurch. Yeah. That's mad. And it is, yeah. it's like very specific, and it's got a setting and a place, and I just never realized. And so I think, yeah, it just, I think, you know, in the, like we were saying about the publishing industry, like it just shows you that, that there's no need to kind of water stuff down or make it more generic for a wider yeah. audience. Actually, the specificity is what makes it gorgeous. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Mm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I have a question for Mary. Um, do you think you'll go uh, back to writing adult novels or you going to mix it up or what do you plan? I'll probably mix it up, yeah. I've, I've, I've drafted something while well, I've been kind of working on the side, um, something that is adult um, murder, murdery kind of book because I do like a good dead body in a book. Um, <laughs> but but at the, at the same time, I'm 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 still under contract with Bloomsbury, so I'm got something else that's supposed to come out with them next year. So I I, I like both. I think there's just so much fun to be had in both. Like I um, I I wouldn't leave YA behind, but definitely I am keen to get back to adult as well. Yeah. And do you guys see any tension, as, as people who both write in both genres, uh, in creating work for both, like, un under your current name? Do you think publishers would respond fine to that? Or do you think that you're, like, in the YA track now for good and you're going to have to have a fight if you want to write a grown an <laughs> no, adult book? I actually, I have an adult book. My next adult book is coming out next year. Um, it's called The Rachel Incident. And it's actually, uh, it's, it's set in Cork again. I seem to keep coming back to Cork, which is... a uh, it's a real surprise to someone who was so keen to leave it. Um, um, and, and yeah, and it's, um, I think that it's made my writing actually much better because my first, I'm very proud of my first two books and um, I, but I never want to look at them ever again. Um, um, because there's just, I've, uh, my brain wants to create, um, you know, tense scenes full of drama and interpersonal relationships and uh, real life stuff that could really happen mm -hmm. but it also wants um, like a demon hand stamping antique selling, selling mm -hmm. guy and what my what since I've started writing YA what's happened is like my brain has found these two different tributaries to go down mm -hmm. and I, so I've got this one place where I can write the maddest thing I can think of and it just and, and my publisher said yeah sure fine and then, as a result, my adult fiction has become far more down to earth. And I don't, I think, what I, the things that embarrass me about my adult fiction now is that I, I, I sort of, I, I, I blow all the money on the stunts. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. like there's, a, there's big stunts you know, happening. And I'm like, actually, because the big stunts are now happening in the YA, I feel like I, I, I can allow my adult fiction to be calmer. Yeah. You know? Yeah, so it really works for me. Yeah. And I think just in terms of like the, the how do publishers respond to this, I mean, I don't know, but mm. but like if you look at what I've done already, like it's so messed up in terms of being some kind of neatly little mm -hmm. branded package. I am not. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the Amazon page, it's like, well, she wrote this, but that looks nothing like this, which looks nothing like that. And I think that that's just kind of the brand now. It's just kind <laughs> of this misshapen <laughs> mishmash of... Yeah. But I think the idea of a like a cohesive literary journey as a writer is a fallacy, you know. Like yeah. I, I think there there was a while there about five or six years ago where, you know, you you couldn't get a short story collection published, and people would be like, mm -hmm. oh yes, well publishers just don't buy short fiction, yeah. and now they're bloody everywhere, they're everywhere. you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah, I think publishing has a very short memory. Yeah. yeah, there's this thing that Neil Gaiman says is that there's two kinds of authors: uh, dolphins and otters. And <laughs> importantly, they're the, the, the two most popular things at SeaWorld. And the thing about dolphins is that they're like, ah, I've trained this human into giving me a treat. You know, they're like, I, I've, I have jumped through my thing and I do my little backwards dance and I've done it kind of thing. And they're, you know, the John Le Carres and the kind of people who are, they know what their audience wants and they can produce it and they do variations on a theme. But you kind of know what you're getting and people love that actually, you know, and it's, it's an amazing way to build an empire. 
and then there are otters. And otters are very cute, but you can't make them do anything. <laughs> like, the guy will come out and be like, sorry everyone, the otters aren't coming out today. And everyone will be like, all right. <laughs> and that's, I think we might be otters. <laughs> It makes a lot of sense. I've never seen an otter in the wild, and I think that says a lot. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And another question here. I have a question. Um, the you talked about adults reading young adult novels. What? How young do kids get interested in young adult? Do you think? Well, I've had I've had correspondence from eleven year olds, mm -hmm. um, and my books are kind of pitched at fourteen up. And I do think that there is that thing where you're. I certainly remember it from being that age, if you're kind of anywhere of a precocious reader, that you, you're always waiting for the next, you always want to get to the next stage, do you know what I mean, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and there's something kind of lovely about that, and like I think as well, growing up with a sister, and my mum was a big reader as well, and just getting into sort of like the other Bolin girl, and being mm -hmm. holding down the page where she learns how to give Henry VIII the blowjob, and, <laughs> and all that stuff, um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, I have like a 12 year old and a newly turned 14 year old and I always kind of think, well, would I let them read it? And um, my 12 year old is, is a very kind of adventurous reader, so he, he would, and I, I would say that he would be quite ready for it. I don't think he's quite interested in reading it just yet. But, um, I, I th and I think the kind of short answer to the question is that it really depends on the child. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to, if, if, a, if, an, if a parent comes to me and says, well, I've got a 12 year old, wants to read the book, I would kind of recommend that they kind of flick through it first because it is definitely aged, I mean, targeted towards the, the older teenager, mm -hmm. young adult rather than teenager. Um, so that would be my advice is just kind of take a skim through it yourself and see what you're comfortable with and what your child is comfortable with um, before before you do. But I think they are. And some 12-year-olds some are, some are not mature enough and some are. Depends on the kid. Yeah. Cool. Oh, we've probably got time for one more audience question, if anyone has any brain. Got one at the back here. So, yeah, I'd just be interested, you know, did you always want to write? Were you starting to write when you were five yourself kind of thing? And do you see there being any difference between your creative process for YA as opposed to writing something for adult adults? Um, yeah, I always wanted to write since I was five. I um, literally kind of wrote my first book at five um, with illustrations. So <laughs> the writing was just, it was never, there was like, there were, the question was, did I want to write and do other things as well? Like, and I was a lecturer for a while. Um, but I, there was no question, like I had to write. There was no alternative. But um, so yeah, I've, I've been writing all my life and I can't imagine not doing it and even if I wasn't publishing I'd still be writing um, because it it's just can't not and I can't remember the rest of the question. Um, I suppose I was just saying did you feel that there's a difference oh, in the way you kind of create no, go about? Uh, no, no, it's exactly the, for me and I, I, I don't know how this would work if you were targeting towards a younger um, audience but for me because it's kind of literally young adults like people I, in my head, kind of older teenagers and university students that have kind of um, definitely the same process, the same amount of work, if not, you know, they get absolutely the same, the same amount of time it takes. Like, I, you often hear people saying, oh, well, you know, they're writing children's books, it's kind of easy to do that. You can just kind of whip them out, like, you know, a few times, a few years. It's not quite, it takes the same, same amount of time, same amount of energy, the same amount of work, I think, in my experience, anyways. No, I completely agree. They're equally as hard as one yeah. another. And I think uh, what's annoying is sometimes people come up to you being, because they write both, because I write adult and YA. Uh, someone will say, oh yeah, you, you're spaffing out another one of those, are you? <laughs> like, mm -hmm. As if like, this is my great money-making scheme and, and then the adult books are the quote-unquote real art. And I just am like, it's all the real art. <laughs> you know, it's all, it's all very much a, a, yeah, who, who I am and what I want to be as, as an artist. Um, but what was the other part of the question again? Oh, always wanting to write. Yes, no, I, I was the same in that, like, when I was a very young kid, I remember, again, cause I'm from a big family, and uh, coming home with a sh short story I'd written when I was seven or something in school and showing my mom that I'd gotten the gold star in it, and then, you know, it going right up in the fridge and it being very, like, my parents, both of them being so supportive, of being like, yeah, and Karen's a writer and that's what she's going to do, kind of thing, and I think, you know, they, they're very encouraging of that. 
Um, but then when I hit secondary school, I just totally lost confidence, you know? And it was, I find it actually very sad now looking back. And I think that's why in, in All Our Hidden Gifts, Maeve is dreadful at school. And I really didn't get on at school either. And this thing of like having this real sense that if you wanted to get into journalism or writing, or you should really be sort of top of the class type of person. And I so, totally lost confidence and I stopped writing altogether. And I remember getting this like dreadful boyfriend when I was about 15. I'm sure he's a fine adult man now, but he's a dreadful 16 year old. <laughs> um, and, and he wanted to be a writer. And I remember getting this thing in my head being like, and I'll be a writer's wife, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and really feeling that, like really feeling that. Like I, you know, I would have this auxiliary career. And I remember giving you, giving him notes on his stuff and feeling like, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. I'm the kind of romantic muse, which is what you want to be when you're a teenager. You want to do nothing, be beautiful and inspire great art <laughs> and collect zero royalties. <laughs> and um, then I, um, what happened, what got me back into writing actually, and, and this kind of feeds back into the losing, wanting to leave Cork thing was that, um, oh, I uh, worked a lot when I was in college and, uh, I made all my friends at my part-time job, but they were all two or three years older than me. And so they all emigrated to Australia or Canada. And then I found myself in my final year of college and they'd all gone. And I was kind of back living at home because they all moved out of the shared house we were living in. And uh, I, I saw them all like, you know, in Australia and Canada doing their thing and putting stuff up on Facebook. And this was kind of the dawn of putting a Facebook album up with 900 pictures in it. <laughs> And I remember feeling like, well, I feel like I'm doing nothing over here. And so I started a blog because I wanted to show them that I was doing something. <laughs> and then I just really grew my confidence from there. And I started um, reviewing gigs for the Cork News, which is sadly defunct now. Um, but with my first kind of ever writing credit, which was so exciting. And then I had about three things in the Cork News, like a free newspaper. And I was like, I'm ready for London. <laughs> And I left and I remember being very shocked that like, you know, Harper's Bazaar didn't want to hire me. <laughs> so then it was six years in marketing. And um, then, yeah, I just kind of, I slowly, I just kept going with the blog that whole time. And then eventually I had done enough to, that to convince an agent that I was worth signing. And, and the rest, as they say, is history, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, I, I do think you lose confidence during those years uh, in a huge way. And if anyone has any children of that age group, I would just say just protect their self-esteem like it is a precious resource because it is, you know? Brilliant. Thank you so much, guys. This was such a wonderful conversation. I think we're just about out of time. So what we're going to do now is you guys are going to hang here and there are some books for sale outside. And if you'd like to get your copy signed, you can come and have a chat to them. But, uh, yeah, thanks again for Lovely. your wonderful conversation. Thank, Thank you for your questions.